nearly live now. Yes, good evening. You're very welcome. Um, can I, on behalf of the members of the church and in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, welcome you to Crescent Church here on University Road for our evening service. If you are here in person, raving the latest Storm Franklin, you are very welcome. If you're at home in the heat, joining us live or watching at some later date, you are just as welcome. So wherever you are, we trust you will be blessed and encouraged and challenged by our time together. Our opening hymn this evening is There is a Louder Shout to Come. The words will appear on the screen behind me. And as per recent local government announcements, the wearing of masks is now voluntary. So after the band's introduction, let's stand to sing this hymn of praise and worship. Tune 
Now let's commit ourselves to the Lord in prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come into your holy presence in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And right from the outset, we want to confess our sinfulness and our disobedience, which lead us into trouble and temptation. Father, help us to fix our eyes on our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who as a perfect man was completely obedient, even to the point of dying on a cross to take our sins away. Lord, we want to give you praise and thanks for your amazing love and mercy to each one of us. We are no longer condemned. We are a new creation. Help us to be encouraged and strengthen us as we stand ransomed, healed, restored, and forgiven. But Lord, you know that we all face trials and doubts and worries and difficulties. You know what a difficult week it has been and continues to be for many in our fellowship. You know the pain and loss and sorrow caused by recent bereavements which have overtaken us. God of all comfort, draw near to us in every situation that we experience. Keep us safe and secure in your everlasting arms. Strengthen us and help us to trust and to obey, knowing that you will deliver us. And for those who love you, all things work together for good. Father, we bring before you our ongoing concerns and worries about the, the COVID pandemic. Lord, we know that you care deeply about each one of us and that nothing takes you by, by surprise. We pray too, Father, for the people of Ukraine and the uncertainty and fear that's threatening their lives. Again, O oh God, guide world leaders and governments so they can make wise decisions and that your will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Father, draw, draw us closer to you in these uncertain times. We pray that you will speak through Ollie tonight and that we will not just hear your word, but we'll put it into practice in the days ahead. So, Father, we ask these things in the precious name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, I've just a few announcements, as most are contained in our weekly emails, and there was a, a mega one recently for us all to digest in terms of easing of restrictions and a greater emphasis on services and activities here in the church building. So can I draw your attention to Wednesday evening at 7.30 here in the church when the second session of Hope Explored series is taking place. This is a great opportunity to invite our friends and our neighbors and our colleagues to come and hear some good news and further details are available on social media. As I've already said, it's great to see so many returning to our church services and I'm sure you find that singing along at home on YouTube or while muted, hopefully, on Zoom, is really no substitute for collectively praising and worshiping our great God. So that's what we're going to do now with the first of our three songs. The initial one is, There is a Redeemer. So after the band's introduction, let's stand to sing. Son, I 
and living your spirit till the work on earth is done. When I stand in glory, I will see his face, and there I'll serve my King forever. Tonight is the fourth week of our series on Peter's second epistle, and our speaker is Ollie Neal. His title is Scoffing at the Scoffers. Ollie's the youth and young people's worker here at Crescent and one of our regular Bible teachers. But just before Ollie comes to speak to us, we're going to sing two more songs, and then the rest of the time is his. This is a newish song, When We See Your Face, and then we'll finish off with There Is a Higher Throne. So again, after the boy band's introduction, let's stand to sing. Like we 
Very good evening, everyone. Thank you for braving the elements to come out tonight. It's pretty hectic out there, so it's great to see so many here. Um, let's turn to God's word together. We're continuing our studies in Second Peter, and today we reach chapter 3, and I'm going to be focusing on verses 1 to 13. Second uh, Peter 3, verses 1 to 13. So do open your Bibles at that chapter, and let me just pray before I read it. Lord, as we turn to your word now, please would you reveal uh, your truth to us. Thank you, Father, that your word is truth, and by your spirit you work it into our hearts and change us. So we ask you might do your work tonight in us, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. 
2 Peter 3 and verse 1. Dear friends, this is now my second letter to you. I have written both of them as reminders to stimulate you to wholesome thinking. I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the command given by our Lord and Savior through your apostles. Above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming, he promised. Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens came into being, and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters also, the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar, the elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire, and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with this promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. I wonder how many of us here this evening suffer from something, a condition, if you like, called present bias. What is that, I hear you say? Well, it's a flaw in our thinking that favors short-term payoffs over long-term rewards. For example, and I speak for myself here, Uh, We often overindulge in sweets and chocolate and fatty food, despite knowing they'll harm our health in the long term. Tastes good in the moment, though, very good. I can testify to that this afternoon, in fact. Or we'll choose the, the easy dopamine hit of a TV show or social media, aimless scrolling, over training our minds and bodies so they're healthy and sharp. As a society, generally, we're short sighted, aren't we? We're taken in by a single election cycle or a news cycle, or a fashion trend, or a viral social media sensation. How many of you were watching planes land at Heathrow this week uh, for hours on end? Um, A very enjoyable pursuit it was. But we want the buzz, the excitement, the instant gratification, don't we? We're drawn to short-term things. And so many of our leaders often invest time and energy into things that will win them votes at the next election, rather than things that will build a more resilient country in the long term. We human beings are so prone to live with blinkers on, to focus on the immediate and the short term. And the Apostle Peter writing in this letter, he knows that we humans are like that. We have that natural inclination or character flaw, if you like. And so we need to constantly be reminded of gospel truth and of God's eternal kingdom. If you think back to the first studies we had uh, where David Farrell was leading us through 2 Peter 1, we learned that one of the primary reasons Peter wrote this letter was to remind Christians of the truth, to refresh their memories about the Lord Jesus Christ, his teaching and his character. He wrote to reassure them of the reliability of the gospel and to encourage them to continue striving towards holiness. And Peter's ultimate desire was that they might remain faithful to the very end. And ultimately, it says in chapter one that they would receive a rich welcome into the kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Isn't that a beautiful picture? Receiving a rich welcome into the kingdom of the Lord Jesus. Peter wanted these Christians to become utterly convinced that God's eternal kingdom was a reality, utterly convinced that this world we live in is temporary and fleeting, and utterly convinced that the way we live down here in the here and now, well, it has an impact upon the way we'll live in that eternal kingdom. 
And so Peter wanted them to reject the narrow, irrational, short-termism that we're so prone to. The Lord Jesus Christ himself put it like this in Matthew's gospel. He said, do not store up for yourselves treasure on earth, where moths and vermin destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where moths and vermin do not destroy and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And this evening we reach 2 Peter chapter 3, and we see Peter restating his goal in verses 1 and 2. Do you see that in this chapter? Look down with me at verses 1 and 2. My letters are reminders to stimulate wholesome thinking, he says. He goes on, remember the words of the prophets. Remember the, com- the commands of the Lord Jesus, he urges them. This is crucial for Peter. He does so because remembering the truth, calling it to mind, it's going to be crucial if these Christian believers are gonna continue faithfully to the end. It will be crucial in motivating them to live for God's eternal kingdom and so live holy lives in the here and now. And one of the things that they absolutely need to remember is this, that the Lord Jesus is coming back. The Lord Jesus is coming back and one day he will come and he will judge the world just as he said he would. Listen to Christ's words in Revelation 22, verse 12. Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense with me to repay everyone for what he has done. Christ's first coming was as savior. We thought about that a lot at Christmas, didn't we? And wonderful, wonderful truth it is. One day he promises he will return as judge. This is a fundamental doctrine and teaching. The Lord Jesus is coming back. He's coming back to make things right. He's coming back to judge the living and the dead. And it's a sobering thought, isn't it? But it's also a wonderfully good thing. Because I'm sure each one of us here long for the evil and injustice in this world to be judged. We long for transformation, don't we? We look at the news each and every day. We scroll through. I don't know what your your choice of of news service is. I scroll through the BBC. And to be honest, I get pretty depressed at the state of our world. Bad news after bad news story. Don't we just long for transformation? Don't we long for justice? Don't we long for the claims of Jesus Christ to be fully and finally vindicated? And for those of us who belong to the Lord Jesus, who've trusted him as savior, that day will not be one of fear, the day of God's judgment. We'll be in glory with him, safe and secure and free from harm. But the Bible is very clear that for those who live in hostility to God and have rejected his son, there is a fearful expectation of judgment. Hebrews tells us it is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. In verses one to seven, we see scoffers making foolish arguments. People who deny outright the truth that God will return to judge the world. Maybe they're saying something like this. Where is this coming you Christians talk about? Do you seriously believe Jesus will return? That's really sweet, that's really antiquated, but it's not gonna happen. That's just superstition. I mean, if you believe that, fine, that's okay, you believe that, but don't try and force it on me. It's irrational, it's unscientific. You superstitious lot. And these scoffers will belittle the Christians, they'll mock and scorn, but what Peter does here is genius because he effectively turns the tables on them and he says, let's look at your beliefs, let's look at what you're saying, let's put your arguments under the microscope. And that's what he does in verses one to seven. He puts their arguments under the microscope and reveals how irrational what they're saying really is. Notice in verse four the argument these scoffers are making. Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. That's the argument. It's very like what scientists and philosophers argue today. This universe is a closed system, they say. There's never been any evidence of outside intervention from some kind of supernatural power. Things have always followed natural laws and processes, and they always will. Things always have been like this, and so they always will be like this. It's a view known as uniformitarianism. Things always have been like this, and so they always will be. And Peter pushes back against this argument, and he points out in verse five that these people deliberately forget the truth. 
They're suppressing the facts. They fail to see that the event of creation itself was a unique, one-time incidence of divine intervention. By God's word, the heavens came into being, and the earth was formed out of water and by water, says Peter. He's saying creation itself proves that it's false to say things always have been like this, and so they always will be like this. And not only does creation demonstrate the foolishness of this argument, but so does the flood. Peter references it in verse 6. The flood, says Peter, is another demonstration of God's acts in history. The scoffers probably attribute the flood to some kind of natural phenomenon. They likely try and explain it away without reference to God. And many do that today about so many of the miracles in Scripture, including the resurrection. But Peter is very clear in verse 6, the flood was an act of God's intervention in human history. God used nature to bring his purposes to pass. The earth was deluged and destroyed, he says, because of human sinfulness. And so Peter's argument goes, if God has used water in the past to judge the world, then we can be confident that he will be true to his word once more and judge this sinful world with fire in the future. The argument of the scoffers, it might be loud, it might be cruel, it might be unkind, but actually when we put it under the microscope, it's hollow and it's irrational. It doesn't fit with the facts. And it's really key here to see what motivated these scoffers. Look at verse three. They're following their own evil desires. That's really important to notice because these guys, they're not objective truth seekers, right? So many philosophers and scientists, they claim like they're object to be objective truth seekers. These guys are not. They don't want a coming judgment. They don't want accountability. They don't want a final eva evaluation of their lives. And we see that today. An American philosopher by the name of Thomas Nagel, he said this, a modern philosopher, I want atheism to be true and I'm made uneasy by the fact that some of the most intelligent and well-informed people I know are religious believers. It isn't just that I don't believe in God and naturally I hope I'm right in my belief. It is that I hope there is no God. I don't want there to be a God. I don't want the universe to be like that. At least he's being honest. At least he's being honest. Peter has exposed these scoffers for what they really are. And doesn't that give you and I a great deal of confidence when we hear their mocking? Because Christianity is profoundly rational. God is faithful to his word. And so we can be sure the day of the Lord will come. In verse 8, Peter turns his attention away from the scoffers and he looks back towards the Christians. And once again, he addresses them with this beautiful term, dear friends or beloved. He really cares for them. He wants them to have confidence in the midst of these harsh accusations. Maybe Peter knows that some of them are really struggling with the waiting. It's not that they don't believe that Christ will return. They believe it all right, but it's just they're struggling. Struggling to get their heads around why he's taking so long. Because life in this world is hard, isn't it? We all know that. We get bruised and we get broken and we get hurt. I'm sure we've all asked at points, why doesn't the Lord come back sooner? Maybe he's forgotten me. Maybe he's forgotten my pain. Maybe he doesn't realize how hard things are for me. Why the delay? How long, O oh Lord, said David in the Psalms. And so Peter reassures his dear friends in two ways. Firstly, he reassures them about the nature of God. You see that in verse 8. With the, with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like a day. This is his first reassurance. To reference back to, to Psalm 90 in verse four, which says of the Lord, a thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by or like a watch in the night. Remember what scripture teaches you about the Lord, Peter urges. Think back. The Lord is not like us. His perspective is so much greater. He sits outside of time. As Psalm 90 verse 2 puts it, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. And to us human beings, a lifetime, 70 or 80 years, it seems like a very long time, doesn't it? Because we're so taken up with the here and now that, that we struggle to get our heads around eternity. Let me adapt a, 
an illustration that I heard Tim Keller give. He said something along these lines. As a child, you uh, maybe longed for, for a new bike or a games console. Maybe there was something you really, really wanted your parents to get you. And I can think back to times like that. Maybe I'd, you'd seen it in a store or online. And maybe you knew that you could have that bike or that console within days if you went to the right store and you paid a maybe a substantial amount of money. But mom and dad had other ideas, and they knew the reason the bike or the console was so pricey was because it was just a brand new release. It was just out. And they knew that if they waited just a few weeks, they'd be able to buy it, and it would be a lot more affordable. But three weeks for a child, it seems like an eternity, doesn't it? I mean, that's like half a summer holiday, effectively, right? It seems like an eternity. You can't wait that long. But mom and dad have a healthy sense of perspective. They know that three weeks isn't going to kill you. And they know how much money is in the bank account. And as a result, they can see what is best for both the child and for the family as a whole. And in many ways, as Christians, we're a bit like the child in that story because we struggle to see the big picture, don't we? We find waiting so hard. But Peter urges us, trust the timetable of the eternal God. He is good. He has a plan. He hasn't forgotten you, dear friends. He does care. He will come back. He will take you home to be with him. He will bring evil and suffering to an end. Trust him. So that's how Peter reassures his dear friends about the nature of God. Then secondly, in verse 9, he reassures them about the character of God. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. It's one of my favorite verses in Scripture, this. It's beautiful, isn't it? Here we learn exactly what God thinks of us, how much he loves us. One of the primary reasons Christ has not returned, says Peter, is because he is patient. He doesn't want to come in judgment until he has given people ample time to repent. God's deepest inclination is not to bring judgment on us. His deepest inclination is in fact to save us, to rescue us from judgment, to rescue us from death. And so he waits. Consider how Christ bore the reproach of the Jewish leaders and the Roman soldiers and the crowds. He could have brought judgment on them in an instant, right? But he didn't. He was patient. On the cross, as men threw accusations at him and abuse at him, he was patient. And one of those men will be thankful for all eternity that the Lord was patient. Because he had time to repent and to turn to Christ for salvation moments before he died. Or what of the the false teachers and the scoffers in this book itself to Peter? By not yet coming in judgment, the Lord is actually being patient with them. I think that's remarkable because it shows the Lord even wants these guys to repent, to be saved. And the clear implication is that they're they're loved by God as well, despite their wretched sinfulness. And so too for us, so too for me. I wonder when you repented and came to trust Christ as your savior. Was it in the last few months? What about the last five years or 10 years? 20 years, 50 years, 80 years, 90 years? I think that covers everyone, if you're a Christian here. What if the Lord had come back in judgment before you and I had repented? We'd have perished, wouldn't we? And this is what the Lord longs we avoid. So much so that he sent his son to bear the judgment in our place. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. That is the heart of God, isn't it? Patience, kindness. Yet so many spurn that grace and kindness. So many spurn his son and in effect say, I'll face God's justice myself. In verses 11 to 13, we learn the solemn truth that the day of God's judgment will come. It will come like a thief. It will come with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. In effect, the curtain will come down on this world. As C.S. Lewis puts it, when the author walks onto the stage, the play is over. This is the moment where judgment comes. 
And Peter's very clear that things will not continue as they are now indefinitely. God will not tolerate evil forever. The day of judgment will come and this world will pass away. And what he says is this, in light of this truth, in light of this, what kind of people ought we to be? And his answer is, you should live holy and godly lives. There is an eternal kingdom. This world is temporary and fleeting, and the way we live now will impact the way we'll live in that eternal kingdom. I guess the question for us is, do we want to receive a rich welcome into that kingdom if we're Christians here? Do you want to have responsibility and treasure in that kingdom? Then Peter says, live for God right now. Be ambitious for the world to come. Don't suffer from present by a short-termism. Don't live with the blinkers on. Remember what is true and what is real. And please don't mishear me when I say this. All those who repent and turn to the Lord Jesus for salvation, well, they will be in God's eternal kingdom. That is guaranteed. Praise God for that. But God's word is also clear that the way we live as Christians here and now, it matters. It's not irrelevant. It matters enormously, and it impacts our lives in the world to come. We'll all be at the celebration if we've trusted Christ. We'll all be joyful, but for some, it seems, the experience will be deeper and more profound than others in some mysterious way. I have a little plaque at home with these words written on it. Only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. It's short, but it makes a profound point, doesn't it? Where am I storing treasure? Brothers and sisters, where are you storing your treasure? Because throughout 2 Peter, he is clear that there is an eternal kingdom to come. There will be a new heaven and a new earth. Consider the highest highs of this life, the most beautiful moments, the most stunning scenery the most beautiful vistas of this old world, there is still a beauty amongst the brokenness, isn't there? Glory in the ruins, if you like. But imagine what the new heaven and the new earth will be like. Revelation 21 gives us a little glimpse, and it excites me. This is what it says. Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. Isn't that a wonderful thing to look forward to? Don't you long for that, dear friends? Let's be ambitious for the world to come. And maybe you're here tonight and you don't know the Lord Jesus. And I want to say you're so, so welcome. It's so good to have you with us. Please come again. But in love, can I urge you to take the words of this passage seriously? They're solemn. They're serious. One day the Lord is clear that he will come in judgment. His patience must come to an end. He must be just. And that is a good thing. The scoffers are wrong. He cannot allow sin and evil to go on forever. Yet the longing of God's heart is that you might never have to face that judgment. And so he waits patiently for you. He waits in the hope that you might come to appreciate his kindness and his love for you, which is very great. So great, in fact, that it's most clearly demonstrated in his son coming to earth to die for you. Christ died so you'd never have to face that judgment. Christ bore it so you can go free. So tonight, then, can I urge you to trust Jesus, to turn from sin, to give your life fully to him, and then come and experience the fullness of life in God's eternal kingdom. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the wonderful truths contained in this passage. We thank you that the Lord Jesus is coming back. We thank you for those, that for those who have trusted Christ, we'll be safe and secure with you for all eternity. But Lord, we also thank you that actually justice will be done one day because 
when we look around the world and when we see the mess it is in and the bloodshed and the suffering and man's inhumanity to man, Lord, we do long for justice. We do long for evil to be done away with once and for all. It destroys lives, ruins families. It's a horrible, horrible thing. Father, and one day you will bring it all to an end. You will wrap it all up. And you will create a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. But Father, we think of your character. We realize that you are incredibly patient. We realize that the desire of your heart is that no one would perish, that all would come to repentance. And so you are patient, Lord. And so you sent your son so that we might never have to face your justice. So Lord, I want to pray that each and every person in this room might know what it is to have a relationship with you through Christ. And I want, to, I want to pray for the Christians, Lord, who maybe are struggling in the waiting. Would they just be reassured by your character, by your goodness? Would they hold to truth even when people mock and scorn? Lord, help us to look forward to that day when you will wipe every tear from our eyes, when there'll be no more death or crying or pain for the old order of things will have passed away. We wait for that day, Lord, with eager anticipation. And we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Ollie. We know that we all will and we all do experience difficult times. But isn't it great to be reassured that as children of the living God, we can depend on his promise that Jesus will return at a time when, when many people don't expect it. He is coming, and he will bring a total transformation of this world. But for now, we need to live in the light of the certain hope of his return. So this week, may we all keep our eyes fixed on him and rejoice in his great salvation. Our closing hymn is, O oh, praise the name of the Lord our God after which your service is over. But I'm sure Ollie will be available if you'd like to have a word with him. Uh, again, thank you for coming. And we do hope that you will be encouraged and continue to trust in our faithful God and his unfailing promises. Let's stand to sing after the band's introduction. Son of hell.